Oh, look. There he goes. Go get you. Go get you. Go get you. Is that a... Yeah, it's a yeah, guillotine. It's a guillotine. Hmm. Ah. Didn't know they were French. Do you honestly think you're fu- Could you be any louder? Ah! <gasps> You, you really trying to trap yourself, dude? I had never noticed it before. I was wondering if it would go off if you stepped on it. <laughs> oh, f uh, slide! The 1970s were a big time for, like, the original horror films. You know, like, the horror films that really set the tone for all the slasher films that came out in the 80s and the 90s. It, it's... It's crazy. There really wasn't a big paradigm shift in uh, in it until I would say 1984, whenever you know Freddy Krueger, you know, came into the fold. Because then it got, it became like more uh, fan, like more like fantastical with like the Dream Warrior stuff. Because every single one of these is based in reality. You know, Friday the Thirteenth is for the better part based in reality, and it wasn't until after. Uh, you know, after Freddy Krueger, that Jason became, like, an unstoppable killing zombie. You know, he literally got resurrected with a lightning bolt to the freaking chest. Yeah. And the thing with, uh, the thing with paradigm shifts in, uh, in horror films is the fact that, par like, they they have to start somewhere. Like, all these, like, we talk about cliches and stuff like that. The cliches have to start somewhere. And I look at films like this. For instance, 1974. Considered by many to be the biggest, like, the most important year for horror films in particular. Because, not just because of this film, but because of another film that a lot of people actually attribute more to uh, more modern horror films. And to what a lot of people say is actually the superior horror film. Uh, Black Christmas. Which... I, you know, which I really need to watch. I, yeah, same. Because you and I both talked about that. We really wanted to watch it one year for uh, Halloween, but we didn't really get a chance to. So I'd like to try and do that, and hopefully, uh, hopefully it'll, uh, hopefully it'll be good. I've heard a lot of people say it, it still stands up to the test of time, and it doesn't show its age that bad, which is, which is cool. I really like that, and also. Uh, opposed to my unpopular opinion about Texas Chainsaw Massacre as of the last time I watched it <clears throat> last year. I don't think it holds up quite as well as everybody remembers. Yeah, I, I hate to say it, but some films are like that. I've watched Texas Chainsaw Massacre multiple times, and I've, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it. <clears throat> the character development, stuff like that. I mean, you know, the fam, you know, the family and all that. Also, uh, you know, Leatherface and just the raw, just the raw like approach that this film has to its subject matter, and it, it, I can see why it took off and became such a legendary thing the way it did. And yeah, I, I still respect it for what it paved the path for. Oh yeah. And everything. I still think Leatherface is obviously iconic. Obviously. But I think as a film, it's a little bit meh. And that's, like and that's fine for you to think that. When I first watched it, I was like, that was amazing. But like, watching it again, I'm just kind of like, just recently, I'm just kind of like, eh. Uh, I might not watch that too many more times during my lifetime, no, to be and, honest. And I get that. And I respect that opinion because the truth is, it's... It, this film's not for everybody. And the film, and, you know, tastes change. People's ideals on films change over time. Me, I used to love uh, the first Friday the 13th movie more than anything. I, I thought it was, like, I originally had it as, like, the best, like, like top five, if not top three horror films ever when I was younger. But the older I got... The more and more it dis it just descended the list, and now I consider it to be a I consider it to be a watermark moment for slasher films as a whole, but I still think it's it's not in my top ten anymore. I think it I, I wouldn't even probably put it in my top twelve anymore. There are some Friday the Thirteenth films I like better than the first one, 
No, I honestly think that several of them are better than the first one. I think six is better than the first one. I think three is better than the first one. I think four is better than the first one. Um, gosh, I, I, there are several that are better than the first one, in my opinion. But either way, though, 1974, a big year for horror films. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Let's go ahead and hop in and see what Dead Meat has to say. Here we go. Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite <laughs> horror movies. I'm James A. Denise, nice. and today we're finally looking at The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, released in 1974. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre has become the most requested uh, franchise crazy. on this channel, and it's not hard to see why. The original film is one of the most influential horror movies of all time, and came out before most of the other landmark films of the genre, including Halloween and, just barely, Black Christmas. Now, just as amazing barely. as the original Chainsaw like a Massacre couple weeks. is, in fact, Chelsea cites it as her favorite horror movie, I'm not sure if everyone who requested this franchise understands just how messed up it gets. And I don't only mean in terms of quality, even though plenty of these movies are straight up stinkers. Texas Chainsaw's continuity is severely convoluted, rivaled only by the clusterfuck that is the Halloween franchise. Get this, the original has three sequels, although parts three and four have completely different characters and storylines. The 2003 reboot with Jessica Biel was followed by a 2006 prequel, The Beginning. 2013's Texas Chainsaw 3D is a direct sequel to the original 74 film. And finally, 2018's Leatherface is a prequel to the original that maintains continuity with the 2013 3D film. Did you get all that? If not, don't worry. There will be plenty of time for review as we spend the next Ugh. two months with this series, during which you'll see a bunch of different Leatherfaces, a whole bunch of people jumping through windows, and some familiar A-list actors along the way. But before all that craziness, we have the original, co-written and directed by, by Toby. Toby. Uber, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre has a certain reputation that it honestly doesn't deserve. Because I'm sure when you hear the name, you think stereotypical super bloody slasher, right? This movie it's is not. not that. Not at all. It's decidedly tame when it comes to gore, and to be honest, it's more of an art house film than a Friday the 13th type slasher. In fact, this movie is the subject of so many academic and analytical reviews that Chelsea devoted an entire episode of the Dead Meat podcast to it earlier this week. Do mm. yourself a favor and check it out, since the kill count only provides jokes and some behind the scenes info. The podcast is where you'll get the fancy intellectual stuff. <laughs> Going into this movie for the first time, you should probably set your expectations accordingly. The first half is surprisingly slow paced, focusing mostly on setting the tone and relishing in Daniel Pearl's gorgeous cinematography. When things finally explode in the final act, it's not a hack and slash kill fest, but rather a soul crushing nightmare of depravity at the hands of this franchise's bedrock, the sadistic Sawyer family. For those of you unfamiliar with this franchise, you may be surprised to learn that it revolves around a family of cannibals. During the series, we'll see the Sawyers go through half a dozen iterations, always changing family members and often changing their name. But the one consistent element of these movies, and the boy that you've all been waiting to see, is the infamous chainsaw-wielding sweet simple Leatherface. He's sometimes scared and confused, other times a bit more outright mean, and at one point we'll even see him fall in love. But most of the time, Leatherface is a bit less evil than other killers like <laughs> Michael or Jason, because he's usually Freaking being taken well. advantage of and ordered <laughs> around by the rest of his much more malicious family members. Now, with all that table setting out of the way, let's finally start the meal and get to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre's kills. Put this on vibrate just in case. Yeah, I'm doing the same. So is my buddy texting if he keeps texting my other buddy in the same group chat. Ah. Uh. Then that will go off a bunch. The movie begins with a title crawl read by Night Court's John Larroquette in his first ever role. For them, the an idyllic summer afternoon drive became... The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. What a nightmare. It implies that the movie was based on true events. And although some aspects of Leatherface and his family were loosely based on Ed, Ed Gein, the butcher yeah. of Plainfield who would make furniture out of stolen <clears throat> corpses, the plot of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is entirely fictional. After establishing the setting of the summer of 73, we see flashball pictures of a crime scene with a sound effect that would come to be iconic. It's used to great effect here, which will not be the case in some of the sequels. The crime scene snapshots lead into a strangely beautiful long shot of a desecrated corpse in a cemetery. I will say this, the 2003 version definitely had effective use of it 
because there was a uh, there was a scene where they were doing like a walkthrough of the uh, of uh, the thing or of the crime scene and everything, and Leatherface killed like the forensics expert and the cameraman who were there like filming it and everything. And uh, I love the fact that they played into like the documentary aspect of it. It's just like this is the only known footage of Thomas Brown Hewitt. He is his body has never been his body has never been found, and he is considered armed and dangerous. It's like yeah. It sends chills up your spine, especially if you don't know if it's real or not. <laughs> As a radio broadcast reports a recent spree of unsolved grave robbings near the fictional town of Newt, Texas, this intro is all very understated and eerie, as is the title card and the opening credits. Like, seriously, is that the friggin' sun? What does that mean? It feels like I'm back in film school, but in a good way. We come out of all of that onto an armadillo in Texas. Huh, Dead armadillo. Pronounced Amarillo. Driving down these Texan roads is a band full of youngsters. And <laughs> yeah, according to my friend who lives in Texas, dude. those are what they call speed bumps in Texas. Yeah, they so are. Apparently, they run out in front of your car all the time who's pretending that he's still in his 20s. Don't worry, buddy. I can relate. Horror's <laughs> first ever final girl, Sally Hardesty, is traveling to her grandfather's grave to make sure it hasn't been robbed as part of that spree the radio was talking about. While a local takes her to check on it, her wheelchair-bound brother Franklin has to hang back and listen to an old-fashioned horror harbinger of doom. I see things. Oh, yeah? What do you see, pal? Besides the bottom of that bottle. On the way to their old <laughs> family home, the kids pass a slaughterhouse where Franklin says their grandpa used to work. He goes into detail about the cattle killing procedures to this dude Kirk and his girlfriend Pam, who's the kind of gal who will ask you what your sign is five minutes after she meets you. Saturn's a bad influence. It's just particularly a bad influence now because it's in retrograde. They see a hitchhiker on the side of the road and decide to pick him up because it's too damn hot for a person to be just walking around here. The hitchhiker, played with a terrifying unstableness by Edwin Neal, says his whole family works in the meat industry and inside his little neck now Sack, he's got the pictures to prove it. Those are, uh, yeah, real nice guy. He ends up grabbing Franklin's pocket knife right out of his hand and uses it to cut himself, all while some wonderfully jolly music plays on the radio. Also, uh, I, I think someone was mentioning it here in the comments, just like the actor who plays a hitchhiker just finished serving in Vietnam and had a rather, and his, he'd rather experience Vietnam again than ever really relive the shoot for the diner scene. Oh. Aren't road trips the best? Edwin Neal's yeah. memorable performance as the hitchhiker was modeled after his nephew who was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Though, as he noted in an interview about it, his nephew was never once violent. Lots of horror movies, this series especially, use people with abnormal psychologies as villains. But it's always important to remember that in real life, those people are more often victims than perpetrators of violence. The hitchhiker takes a picture of Franklin and tries to force him to buy it. Two dollars. It's a good picture. But when the kids say no, thanks, he gets upset and lights the picture on fire with some gunpowder. As if that wasn't bad enough, he then takes out a straight razor and cuts Franklin's arm with it. That Bro. finally gets them to pull over and kick the hitchhiker out, and the kids drive away as he marks their van with his blood and blows raspberries in their wake. You kids should have been more careful. You're living in a post-Charlie Manson world here. They pull up to a gas station slash barbecue joint and ask the proprietor if he knows where they can find their old family home. You boys don't want to go mess around the old house? Yo, dude, you don't know where I want to mess around. Establishing the cliches. There's always the creepy old man at the rest stop right before the chaos begins. who's just like, y'all don't want to go over there. Always the same thing. No, and better not go to that house over there. Yeah, yeah you don't want to go down that road. Right. It's gonna oh. say uh, there's some bad shit down that road there. It's gonna say you don't want to go down that road. Don't do it. Don't go down that road. Next thing you know, you're gonna come home and find the milkman fucking your wife. <laughs> 
The station is out of gas, though, so the Sorry. only things they leave with are a bag full of barbecue and a near-empty tank. They get to their old family house and start exploring it, with Sally showing the others her old room. Disco Steve flirting with the final girl. Poor Franklin's unable to come upstairs, though, which makes him feel pretty left out and leads to him also blowing raspberries in frustration, kind of like the hitchhiker. If I have any more fun today, I don't think I'm going to be able to take it. What I love about Franklin, though, is that he's only partly sympathetic because he's also super whiny and obnoxious as all hell. In mm -hmm. fact, actor Paul Partain, rest in peace, decided to stay in character for the entire shoot, so the rest of the cast ended up avoiding him on set. Unfortunately, Franklin was such a whiny bastard. I was afraid if I ever took him off that I couldn't get him back, and so I kept him on. Yes, it was real effective. We are ready to kill each other. <laughs> <laughs> Pam and Kirk head out to an old watering hole, only to find it's been dried up, but then they hear an engine running at a nearby farmhouse and head over there to see if there's any spare gas that they can buy for their van. Judging by the car park they find in the backyard, these kids might just be the luckiest travelers in all of Texas. Or at least that's probably what they're thinking right now. They go around to the yeah. front porch, where Kirk finds a nasty tooth that he puts into Pam's hand. She don't want no tooth fairy money and storms off, while Kirk's manly knock accidentally opens the front door. Not too much to look at inside, unless you're a big fan of taxidermy and Twin Peaks. Oh, and a uh, pig squealing? <coughs> Kirk happens to love all three of those things, so he steps inside for a fun time, <laughs> only for this to happen. What's up? Don't. Just as with livestock, the first hammer hit doesn't kill Kirk instantly, so Leatherface has to hit him again before taking him back to the kitchen with an iconic sliding door slam. Game over, Kirk. Outside. <laughs> yeah. Also, the also just the Just as with livestock, the first hammer hit doesn't kill Kirk instantly, so Leatherface has to hit him again before taking him back to the kitchen with an iconic sliding door slam. Also, that that right there, the little uh, the little hit with the 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 score right there as the door slams shut, mm -hmm. super effective and super simple. Doesn't require anything like too over demanding. Game over, Kurt. It's outside. Pam ah! Jesus. That was super effective, notices too. notices that Kirk has disappeared, <laughs> and we get another iconic shot that follows her from a low angle as she slowly approaches Booty. the house. This shot was a last-minute idea by cinematographer Daniel Pearl that the producers tried to nix since it wasn't on the shot list. Toby Hooper overrode the producers, and it's since become one of the most famous shots from the film, even if actress Terry McMinn wasn't a big fan of it at first. And then I saw in Cinemascope and Technicolor my cheeks right <laughs> in the screen and I was completely horrified for years. She has what? since come around to it though. I'm laughing now because now I think it's great. Get back up there. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Kirk, Pam also lets herself into the house. She had a good which booty. Which makes this a home yes. invasion movie if you look at it from Leatherface's perspective. Especially when Pam starts tripping all over the place and trashing his stuff. Come on Pam, this is their very important chicken room. They keep their best Bacock. bones in there. And don't even think about sitting on that Scala futon. That thing's on loan from Guillermo del Toro. All of the crazy <laughs> Hell in yeah. this room and throughout the movie was made oh. by production designer Robert Burns, who also taxidermied an actual armadillo corpse for that shot in the beginning of the film. Bob oh, Burns was one of the most pivotal players in this movie's success. He would literally drive around to local farms gathering actual animal bones to make all these Sawyer family props. Without him and his creepy decorations, this movie wouldn't be half as effective as it is. After taking a long, slow-ass motherfucking look at all the horrors surrounding her, Pam finally decides to go on and get, only to run into Leatherface on her way out. Yet another classic moment occurs when he grabs her on the porch and heaves her back into the house. And it only gets worse for Pam when he takes her to the kitchen and uses a meat hook to hang her up like so many animal carcasses. Although it's brutal and terrifying, it's shot in a surprisingly tame way, which is also the case when Leatherface revs his chainsaw up and gets to carving into Kirk's corpse. None of this is pleasant, but it's a whole lot less explicit than you'd probably expect. That'll change in the sequels. When Kirk and Pam are gone longer than expected. Once again, gore is not required to personify the horrific scene that you are witnessing. <laughs> Saw was the exact same way. They didn't need gore. It was... At least during the first one. Exactly. And Jerry offers to go look for them and travels through the woods as the sun goes down. Disco Steve 
walking into the sunset. He gets to the old house and also comes around front where he proves that B&E is just part and parcel for all these rude ass kids or 30 year olds. He heads back into Leatherface's playroom and although the meat hook is empty, there are sounds coming from the freezer. He opens it to find Pam. Wait, why is she still? Wasn't she just... Oh, there she is. Get on up, girl. One of the best things about this movie is the sound design, from all the industrial sounds that Toby Hooper recorded in his own home to the sudden instances of loudness like that one. And this one. <laughs> Leatherface runs in and smashes Jerry's skull to kill him nice and quick. Disco Steel hopping on the kill count. With Jerry taken care of, Leatherface puts Pam back in the icebox. And that's actually the last time we see her, so I have no choice but to put her on the kill count now. Maybe she froze to death in there? I, I would say so. Man. Regardless, Leatherface I'd is getting so. sick of playing defense here. Well, where are all these darn kids even coming from? Gosh, I moved to the countryside to get away from Hooligan Reed. The late Gunnar Hansen played Leatherface so perfectly in this movie that it's easy to feel bad for the poor guy. Just keep licking at your messed up teeth, Leatherface. It'll all be okay, my sweet boy. Since Jerry had the keys in his pocket, the Hardesty siblings are stranded by the van, so they end up having to set off into the darkness to find it. Man, it is super freaking dark in these woods. Franklin, could you please shine that flashlight somewhere useful? Stop. Stop. Oh, Yo. And he saws into Franklin like a sapling, carving the poor boy's body up right there in his wheelchair while his sister watches and screams like a mad woman. Fun fact, the blood sprays here came from Hooper and makeup artist Dottie Pearl crouching down on either side of the wheelchair and spitting fake blood out of their mouths onto Leatherface. <laughs> <laughs> I can just see, just see Toby Hooper outside, just like. <laughs> like why uh, don't they just use like a turkey baster or something? <laughs> maybe because I think they thought it would be too pretty because if it sprays out in like a straight line yeah, versus it being like visceral and all over the place. I think it would. I think to them, it, they maybe they tried it like that and they said. It's like it wouldn't be straight lines on his on his like outfit. Instead, like let's let's try something else. If I were them, I'd have done like a whoopee cushion ending on the end of the turkey baster. So whenever it sprays out, it does like the. Yeah. That's what I would have done. Fill a balloon with fake blood and just like kind of like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just spray it out like that. It's my thought. Just. Anyway. Sally eventually gets the sense to run away and heads through the thickets. It's, to it's the been almost 50 years. Seen, hoping let's it'll call bring it, her let's call it even. From the chainsaw wielding maniac on her heels. But of course, the light ends up being Leatherface's fun house of horrors. And he don't exactly need a key to get through that front door. While he saws into it, Sally runs upstairs and into a back room where she finds a corpse or two sitting in chairs, unable to offer her any advice. We'll see a lot of dried up corpses of unknown people in the chainsaw series, and I won't be in including them on the kill count. It's fine, don't worry about it. Rather worry about poor Sally, since Leatherface is finally through the door. Sally's not done running, though, and doesn't even hesitate to crash through the upstairs window and fall to the ground to escape Ouch. her would-be killer. We start the second lap of Sally's final girl circuit, which once again takes us through the haunted forest. The finish line of this lap is that gas station they had stopped at earlier. Sally bursts through a side door and falls onto the floor, but Leatherface doesn't seem to follow her inside. Instead, the old man from the gas station sits her up and tells her everything's gonna be okay. He'll go get his truck and take her to a hospital. While he's out, Sally notices the sizzling meat this guy's got cooking, which, you know, wouldn't be all that bad on its own. Except when he comes back, he's sporting an awfully creepy smile on his face. Oh, and also, he's got a human-sized sack and some rope. Yeah, them some red flags, girl. Sally wisely grabs a knife to defend herself with, but everybody knows that Broomstick beats Knife. Oh, and Sally. Broomstick also beats Sally. The old man, who's known as the cook in this movie, but will come to be known as Drayton Sawyer, knocks Sally out and ties her up, then bags her and drags her into his truck. Man, poor Sally. Really out of the frying pan and into the cook fire with this one. I hope you're not too uncomfortable down there. Well, I would be if you stopped poking me with that broomstick, dick. The cook slash Drayton Sawyer is an absolutely loathsome motherfucker, and he's played brilliantly by Jim Sedow, who was pretty much the only experienced actor in this movie. As Drayton approaches the Sawyer house, he 
sees the hitchhiker in his native state walking down the side of the road. Drayton gets out of the truck and yells some slurs at the hitchhiker before giving him the old broomstick beatdown in another of this movie's brilliant and beautiful shots. God damn, I love this cinematography. They get to the house with Drayton still hooting and hollering at the hitchhiker because it turns out these dudes are brothers to each other and to Leatherface. Look what your brother did to that star! It's weird. I always <laughs> used to think that Drayton was the hitchhiker and Leatherface's dad. But I guess he's just the oldest brother. And right now, he's taking that brotherly broomstick to his youngest sibling, Leatherface. Leave him alone, Dre Dre. All he wants to do right now is dress and sound like Mrs. Doubtfire. <laughs> the hitchhiker, who will come to be known as Nubbins, ties up Sally and discovers her identity, much to his delight. I thought you was in a hurry. Yeah, Sally's in a real bad place right now. And if you don't want to watch chaotic misery inflicted on a captive girl for 10 minutes straight, well, uh, I got some bad, bad news, news for you, friend. Before the festivities can begin, though, you better get Grandpa and bring him downstairs. Yeah, set that dusty boy right at the head of the table. <laughs> the Sawyer boys cut open Sally's hand and tell their granddad to take this, her blood, and drink of it. And he does. <laughs> Man, I thought that dude was dead. But turns out, all he needed was some teenager blood, and he turns into the Six Flags guy. The Sawyer bus is coming, and everybody's jumping. Grandpa Sawyer, the character, is supposedly 124 years old, but he was played by John Dugan, who was only 19 at the time. The character's <laughs> incredible makeup, which took five to seven hours to apply, was done by Dr. W.E. Barnes in his one and only film credit. His actual no. job was as a plastic surgeon. Also, if you did Grandpa Sawyer's dance moves here, you'll be happy to know John Dugan can still do them nearly 40 years later. Sally passes out, and when she comes to, she finds herself in the middle of a fucking nightmare. Her hands tied down to some other hands, and her shrieks of suffering only mocked and echoed by her tormentors. Whoa, and is that a face lamp up top? Yo, look at that face lamp! Shut your mouth! Well, sorry, Drayton. If you didn't want me commenting on that face lamp, maybe don't have a face lamp. This miserable dinner scene is the most horrific part of the movie by far, and was also also, the most torturous thing to film. They shot for over 24 hours straight, although there is some dispute as to the exact number. That proved to be like a 27 hour shooting day. 26 hour. It was like a 27 hour shoot. Almost 36 hours straight we shot. Since they filmed in July in the middle of Texas. <laughs> you notice that they said, like, he initially said 24 and it's like, it's been disputed. I'm like, oh, so it wasn't, at, it wasn't 24 hours, it was probably shorter. And then every single recollection is like 26, 27, 27, yeah. 36. Like, Jesus. Sis, with the windows blacked out and a bunch of film lights all over the place, internal temperatures reached 120 degrees, cooking the meat they were using as props and making plenty of people sick. Boy, was it hot and the meat got rotten in a hurry. I never did get ill physically where a lot of people did. They run outside. <laughs> Come back in. There was a moment during the film when, during the dinner scene, when I went out and threw up. Sally tries to beg Drayton for mercy, but that goes about as well as you'd expect it to. You can make him stop doing shit. The hitchhiker says that his older brother can't do shit, because he's just the cook, and it's the younger bros who have to do all the distasteful killing work. I, I just can't take no pleasure in killing. To get out of this table-set hellscape, Sally even offers up the only thing she has. Do anything you want. But this plea of desperation falls on deaf ears. These men aren't motivated by usual desires. They're just sadistic cannibals who take pleasure in other people's pain. You'll find no sympathy from them, Sally, no matter how hard you look with your eyes. Damn, you looking hard too, huh? Like blood vessel hard. Drayton tells his younger <laughs> brothers to get on with it and kill her. But the hitchhiker I'm going to say that the, the macro lens that, Sally, no matter that they I'm use here must have cost an arm and a leg because... Like, we talk about them now. Macro lenses on digital cameras can cost tens of thousands of dollars, especially on, like, a, on a good quality camera. I hate to imagine how much Toby Hooper had to, like, spend on, like, just renting this. Because you know he couldn't buy it outright. Not with the money that they had back then. How hard you look with your eyes. Damn, you're looking hard too, huh? Like blood vessel hard. Drayton tells his younger brothers to get on with it and kill her. But the hitchhiker decides that Grandpa's the man for the job. You always said he's the best. He's the best, all right. My old grandpa's the best killer there ever was. They arm him with a hammer and send Sally into a screaming pile of jump cuts. <laughs> 
Then they untie her and bring her over to Grandpa's killing bucket. And what follows is a super darkly comedic scene where Grandpa who's supposedly the best at killing, can't even hold the hammer in his hand long enough to strike Sally. Toby Hooper would try to focus more on dark humor like this in Texas Chainsaw 2, which I think he does to pretty good effect. With Drayton cheering him on and Leatherface all but doing the work for him, Grandpa finally starts landing blows on the back of Sally's head. But when the hitchhiker tries to take over, Sally seizes the opportunity and gets away from that, once again crashing through a window to escape like a baller. She's been tortured by the Sawyer so long, it's already freaking morning, but she wastes no time limping down the road with the hitchhiker already in hot pursuit and his younger brother Leatherface rushing out to join him. The hitchhiker catches up to Sally and slashes at her back, playing with his prey long enough that she manages to get out to the main road. Right as a semi-truck rolls up to them, Sally gets away from the hitchhiker, who's not quite as lucky, and instead gets the Gage Creed treatment oh, with his big rig's big yeah. ass tires. For this death, they filmed him getting hit by the truck in reverse, a real simple trick, and then obviously used a dummy for the undertread body. Sally watches the truck pull over, and although the driver gets out to help her, he nopes right back into the cab after seeing Leatherface and his chainsaw. For some reason, instead of driving away, he and Sally climb out of the truck's passenger side door. I seriously don't know why they did that, but at least yeah. the truck driver grabs a monkey wrench on his way out so he can ask Leatherface knock knock. Hit you in the head with a monkey wrench? That causes Leatherface to fall and cut up his own leg <laughs> but he's back up in no time as Sally and the truck driver haul ass down the street. A blue pickup truck joins the madness and pulls over long enough for Sally to hop inside and uh, just don't think about the semi truck driver. Some say he's still running down the street to this very day. <laughs> Sally is driven away from Leatherface in a few more infamous shots some of which are featured in my extended intro and her terror turns into glee as she realizes that she's finally escaped the unspeakable horrors wrought by this crazed chainsaw murderer and his sadistic family of cats. <laughs> that final scene right there, uh, Toby Hooper was handling the camera himself, and he told Gunnar Hansen to just go for it. With, like, throwing caution completely to the wind. And he said that Gunnar almost, like, hit him a few times with the chainsaw. Mm. Just, like, while he was spinning it around and everything. Like, yeah. yeah. And There's she, the iconic chainsaw dance, though. Yeah. But, hey, sacrifice for the art, dude. They Hopefully even put the that in uh, Dead by Daylight, because uh, if you miss and ricochet the chainsaw off something, he basically goes crazy with it for a second and does the spins and shit. <laughs> That's awesome. Invite to their dinner party? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Yum. Five people died in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which might be lower than you expected, but I tried to warn you about that. It's actually a little time. higher than I expected. I was thinking it was only four, four people. And only one woman, giving us a mostly blueberry meat pie. And with a runtime of 83 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 16 But then again, when I'm watching minutes. these movies, I'm usually not counting the killers getting killed, whereas he did, so... Yeah. That's why I was thinking four. So technically, I think I was right. Like... Four not, victims. Not counting the hitchhiker, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Kirk. It kicks off the movie's kill count and comes out of yeah. nowhere. And I love the way it's done in mostly silence. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to, uh, Jerry, I guess? I actually think all these kills are effective. But if I include the meat hooking as part of Pam's death, then I think it's got to go to Jerry. And that's yeah. it. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre came out in 1974 and was actually banned in the UK for 23 years. Toby Hooper would make the drastically different sequel a dozen years later, which I'll be looking at next week. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons. Yeah, like the Jamie sequel to Kaya, this is Daniel much like Tatsu, the sequel Josh to Green, Evil Dead. And Light and Color Lab, who has a channel so where he does Kill Counts for games. I'm just as excited as all of you to be covering the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh, I was just letting him finish before I went off. Series. The only reason it took me so long is because I like to space out the big franchises. It wouldn't be as fun for me if I just knocked them all out right in a row. Thanks, everybody. Be good people. So whereas the first Evil Dead was like serious, and when they did two, it was like a dark comedy kind of retelling. Yeah, and, uh, except it wasn't as successful as the original, mm -hmm. much like how Evil Dead 2 was more successful than the original. Yeah. It, it's it's weird how that works. Sometimes the dark also, comedy... Also, Texas Chainsaw 2 isn't really a retelling. It's more of a 
sequel, Direct I, sequel guess, yeah, but, uh, I guess. It's a dark comedy as opposed to the seriousness of the original. Yeah. So I've actually still not got to watch all of it. I've only seen like the first half, but my buddy was showing me the first half. Is uh, the uh, fucking what's his face with the hook that scratches the plate on his head? I I damn it. Um, he's Great. played by the same guy that plays Otis Driftwood. Oh, Bill Mosley. Yeah, yeah it's Bill yeah. Mosley. Is so the guy that's in the thumbnail there? That's yeah. Bill. Go figure, man. Yeah. Bill Mosley, what a character. So yeah, this was uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre Kill Count by Dead Meat. I gotta say, yeah, Texas Chainsaw Massacre it it has its benefits and it's and it definitely like its existence is is definitely validated with with this. And honestly, I I'm grateful that it exists because if not, then there would like then we would have been deprived of so much in terms of inspiration for horror films. Mm -hmm. And, uh, God, we really need to watch Black Christmas because, like, like I said, that one I would say is probably the more, the more, like, used in terms of modern, in more modern horror films. Whereas the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you could definitely tell, like, they were going for big time shock factor with that. And you know, just, just completely horrifying monstrosities of uh, of humanity, like uh, like Leatherface and the and the, the and his brothers and everything. But anyway, I guess that's gonna do it. So uh, this was uh, you know once again, this was Dead Meat. If you want to see more from Dead Meat, click their name in the title of the video. And until next time, I'm Nate. I am Nick. We'll see you later, everybody. Peace.